Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Okay, the March 27, 2023 regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. May we please have a roll call. Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Stewart. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Uri. Here. Mayor Silverstein. I'm here as well. You have a quorum. Okay, we will now hear communications from the public on the closed session item. Remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item. Do we have any speakers on the closed session item? No, we don't have any in-person speakers or any attendees at the moment in the Zoom webinar. So you don't have any speakers on the closed session item. Okay, so we'll close the public um, communications on that item. And we will now recess to closed session to discuss the item listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 630 to begin the regular meeting and hear closed session report.
Regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called back to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. May we please have a roll call. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. You have a quorum. Great. Um, Doug, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Uh, Trevor, can we please have a closed session report? Yes, it's 6 o'clock p.m. The City Council met at, in open session and recessed a closed session. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Great, thank you. And Kelsey, may we please have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on March 17th, 2023, with the amended agenda posted on March 24th, 2023. Thank you. Okay. Um, after we approve the agenda, we're going to break for a recess. Um, I'd like to propose, uh, I'll move in addition to approving the agenda, that we move item 6A to the first item of business. Um, and I also want to move that we um, adjourn the meeting in memory of Reverend Paul Robert Elder. Mayor, I'll second, second Ma that. Mayor, I'd like to also recommend we adjourn the meeting in, in honor of John Wall. Uh, John was one of the early members of the Malibu community who who fought for uh, the cityhood. Uh, he, he, he did a, an awful lot for us, and I just think it's worth including him in the uh, conclusion of the meeting. Well, I'll accept that, Marianne. A uh, friendly amendment, can we also, um, in honor of those who died today at the school in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, three children and six, uh, three adults. So do we, I think we have a motion and a second to move up item 6A to, the, to when we return uh, and to adjourn in memory of John Wall and Reverend Paul Robert Elder, and also in honor of the um, victims of the Nashville shooting. Can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. So we will now take a recess and move to the multi-purpose room for the welcome reception. The meeting will reconvene at approximately uh, 7.15. Let's go for 7.15. And um, this is, uh, we want to welcome the public back to City Hall. So uh, let's go in the other room. This is your meeting, Norm. You've been looking for this room. <laughs> Much. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cookies and everything. Hi there. Hi. You, you are new. I am. Right. Chris Sutherland. That's me. Right. Very nice to meet you. Chris. 
Okay, it's 715. We're back in session. So um, by agreement, we're going to start with item 6A, which is the Malibu Bluffs Park Snack Shack. And we will now hear from, I'm sorry, let me start. We'll now hear item 6A, Malibu Bluffs Park Snack Shack. Remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item, and you will be called after the staff report. First thing we'll do is have a staff report, please. Okay. Uh, good evening, council members. Tonight we'll be presenting the Malibu Bluffs Park Snack Shack, and uh, I'll start off the the PowerPoint uh, and gives you some brief information about this item. So the, in reviewing uh, the Snack Shack, uh, the California Coastal Commission issued a coastal development permit um, on, in December of 1982, which allowed the temporary use of the concession stand and ball fields. Um, the California Coastal Commission, uh, sorry, <laughs> waiting for, Maybe, can I, okay, um, issued coastal development permit um, in 1986, which approved the permanent concession stand and ball fields. <laughs> Let me give me one second. On this slide, what we have for you is the permitting history of the concession stand and the ball fields. In 1982, the county, I believe it was, the county obtained a permit from the Coastal Commission for a temporary ball fields, uh, two temporary ball fields, including a concession stand and restrooms. Uh, at the time, the thought was that these would be structures that would eventually be removed uh, to open up the park as more open space and, and hiking type activities. In 1986, an amendment was filed by the county and what was approved by the Coastal Commission was to amend that permit to turn those temporary structures into permanent structures. And it's my understanding from looking at the plans and also the site photographs, it appears that what was there, uh, the, the snack shack in it, its previous current form, that's that would, that's what came from this permit, uh, this uh, temporary structure turned into a permanent structure. Based on the permitting history, there was no indication of a w water connection or wastewater connection. We, uh, and the reason on the wastewater connection, the reason why we don't believe there was one there is that um, in working with public works, when we were looking at the flows to, for the allocation for the purposes of the Civic Center wastewater treatment plant, the only flow that was documented uh, was what flowed into the on-site wastewater treatment system that was connected to the Michael Landon Center. The city assumed responsibility of the park and the structures in 2006 when it was taken over from LA County. From 2006 to 2018, the Snack Shack uh, was operated without the benefit of permit from LA County Department of Health. And the Snack Shack had ceased operations of, during the Woolsey fire and has been deemed inoperable. We can go into that a bit more later if needed as we go into this presentation. If I could have the next slide, please. Oh, do we do it? Force a habit from the Zoom days. <laughs> So Bluffs Park is located in the Open Space Zoning District. That's OS on our maps uh, from the LIP and the Malibu Municipal Code. Per the City of Malibu's Municipal Code and the Local Coastal Program, when you look at the uses table, it states that refreshment stands, ice cream stands, and other fixed location outdoor food vending stands are not allowable uses. So that is the zoning issue that we have run up against. And I apologize for the small print here. We'll just kind of go over this uh, quickly. Uh, but what you have here is a list of the allowable uses 
per the city's municipal code and local coastal program. So the first category are permitted uses. Those are uses that do not need a conditional use permit. They're allowed by right, if you will. Uh, so these are items that you could do without obtaining a use permit from the city. So uh, what you have there are equestrian and hiking trails, camping, parks, beaches, playgrounds, public beach access way. Um, those uses do not need a permit. Now, any of the construction to make those uses, I want to be clear, the, the construction itself, that could be a development permit may be necessary there. The use is permitted with a conditional use permit. That's something that goes before the Planning Commission. Those are emergency communications facilities and then uh, ancillary uh, facilities that, that are public facilities that support our Civic Center wastewater treatment facility. And primarily that was put in the code because of the need for some of the offsite infrastructure such as injection wells, pumps, or, or pump stations. For example, there are injection wells on the parcel directly next to, um, or excuse me, there are wells on the parcel directly next to the Landon Center. It's now the state again, and those wells are for water quality monitoring out of Pepperdine. And then also with a wireless telecommunications facilities permits, a wireless uh, telecommunications system or facility could be placed on the property. So those are the uses that are identified as allowable uses in our code. Okay. Um, so we just wanted to give council an idea of the site and where everything was located. So in the image of your scene, uh, there are three different storage containers. Uh, the snack shack there in the middle, and we also have portable restrooms kind of in the center of everything. And here's a few photos of the outside of the existing snack shack. Um, these are the areas that would normally be serviced from, uh, people would serve you food from, so it's in quite disrepair. And here's a few photos of the inside. There is no foundation in the snack shack, and so we are concerned about that and from a building and safety perspective. And uh, it's just not looking good in there, <laughs> as you can see from the photos. So in reviewing, in, re in reviewing the existing structure, um, there are some concerns related to remodeling. So how about you? In both the municipal code and also the city's local coastal program, there are provisions for maintaining a non-conforming use or non-conforming structure. Uh, while a some sort of accessory building, you know, that is something you can have in, in this particular zoning district, uh, the use of the concession stand, as I brought up earlier, is a, a concern, reconciling it. If it were possible, and we have the city's building official available, if there are questions to this nature, if, if we went down the remodel route, we would be able to remodel the structure in a way to maintain its uses. However, I uh, would like to put some qualifiers on there. Uh, you can't intensify a use. So if it were to be remodeled, it essentially would need to go back to a structure that was uh, something that didn't have water, and didn't have a sewer connection. Uh, I'm not 100% certain about the status I mean, of an electrical, ever having a legal electrical connection. Uh, that obviously is not such a, an issue. That's something we could do. Um, but water and sewer would definitely be intensification because as originally permitted, there it does not appear that it was ever intended to, to really be a cooking facility. It was more of a vending or uh, you know, selling of prepackaged. Uh, so a remodel, uh, if it were possible, but given the, the, the situation and the current structure of, of, and its condition, it, it seems that a remodel would be a, a difficult task to do, and it, it still would fall short of the, ex the expectations of what folks are looking to do in the future with this structure. S some immediate replacement options uh, that don't have any conflicts with the code 
are a non-permanent concession stand, something that's mobile, something that doesn't have a fixed location on the ground. If there's a fixed location on the ground, then that triggers the definition of development per our zoning ordinances. And when you trigger the definition of development, that's when we have to look at allowable uses and uh, issue a, a building permit or, or planning permits. Uh, Non-permanent structures are not seen um, as something considered development because they could be moved. Food trucks, uh, food services trailers, so these are some options that could be considered in the uh, immediately uh, as a way to perhaps uh, put something out there to, to solve the need. So Little League currently operates a non-permanent concession stand. So um, they are serving pre-packaged foods such as chips or sodas, those sorts of things out of a temporary facility that um, is put up and taken down daily. Um, and this is required, we, they have to get a health department permit to do this type of concession stand. Um, there's no cost to the city for them to operate this type of um, non-permanent concession stand. So this is the easiest option that, that is currently being done at the moment. Um, there is also an option for food trucks. Um, as you know, everything's contained inside the food truck. They sell hot and cold food. Um, and it is up to the food truck operator to get a health department permit and the city. Uh, we make sure that all health department permits are valid and we also require insurance from each food truck that is on our facility. And once again, this is no at no cost to the city. Um, there is an option for a food service trailer. This would be temporary and movable. Um, you can, if this were the option selected, you can um, customize these food service trailers so you can cook inside them um, and serve the hot and cold food out of them. The utilities are a little tricky, but it is uh, it has a tank for the water, the kitchen water, the black water that how would have to be uh, serviced either weekly or daily, depending on use. And uh, there is a holding tank for fresh water, which would also have to be serviced. And in this option, you can get a generator or you can hook up to a city utility. Um, and if that were the case, we'd have to upgrade our utilities at uh, Malibu Bluffs Park. And the anticipated cost for this service is about $90,000. And this um, option, with all the services included, it could be in the range of 1000 to 1300 to complete those services monthly. So that is the addition of the propane tank, uh, which services like the cooking stands, those would have to be filled every 16 hours of use and then to empty the tanks. So that's the cost of that one. Some permanent options that could be considered, uh, but once again, we be mindful of the zoning issue here, is a permanent precast concession stand, uh, restroom and storage building. So it will go more into detail on that. So a building that it's multi-use. There's also, of course, a re a replacing the metal shipping container in kind with a another a shipping container, but put in the amenities that uh, the groups are interested in. Both of these options are options that have a that trigger the definition of development. So we would be requiring uh, planning and zoning permits. And then the other option or other issue about that would have to be considered by the council, but it is something the council has within their purview, is that as I mentioned earlier, uh, the wastewater allocation. Right now, it's my understanding that Bluffs Park, its wastewater allocation is primarily taken up or, or mostly taken up, if you will, by the, the Michael Landon Center. So if uh, new bathrooms were to be added, uh, a kitchen sink, or whichever it may be, the wastewater allocation would have to be increased. If that does have to happen, staff would bring an item to the council for consideration. It would be up to the council to approve a modification to the allocation that we have for Bluffs Park flowing into uh, our Civic Center treatment facility. 
This would be an example of a precast concession stand. Uh, this type of building, as mentioned in a previous slide, could house both the snack shack, restrooms, and also storage uh, in the park. And right now, for example, there is a storage need in, in the ball fields area because, if I'm not mistaken, there are two trailers or two uh, shipping containers that functioned as storage, and then the third shipping container was the concession stand. As you can see, this, of course, has a higher cost. However, this would be something that's a permanent structure and would be uh, hooked up to uh, a potable water connection and also sewer connection as well. And in this example here, this would be replacing the shipping container in kind. Uh, another shipping container could be purchased. Uh, however, it would need to have upgrades to it uh, to, to get it to the food preparation requirements uh, required by the county's Department of Health. So there are two options regarding the permitting options. Um, the first option is our prepackaged, which is currently being used by Malibu Little League. And that's just our examples of chips, candy, prepackaged things that do not require on-site preparation. The second option is food preparation. So this is the trailer option or the concession stand option where we're serving hot and cold food items. We can grill hamburgers and hot dogs and uh, microwave burritos, <laughs> ice cream, all the good stuff. <laughs> so um, that are the, those are the two permitting options that the Department of Public Health requires or offers. Um, and here's just some permitting uh, requirements that the health department has. Um, they would, I think the league or whoever's using this option has a 90 day period and 25 total service days to sell. Um, and there must be a restroom facility within 200 feet of the facility and water has to be heated at 100 degrees, and we have to have dedicated restrooms for anyone who's handling the food that aren't open to the public. Um, it takes about two weeks for the health department to process um, most temporary food facility permits, so they have a pretty fast turnaround time. And then here's some additional requirements for the uh, food preparation, so if you're serving uh, hot and cold, if you're grilling and serving hot food from uh, your concession area, there's just a listing of kind of what their requirements are. So more than what we had in our current snack shack. So a three compartment sink with hot water heater, a food prep sink, refrigeration and freezer, ventilation, and then connection to utilities. Uh, if we were to allow this option for leagues or users, um, we would require the league to obtain the permit through the health department and then as a city we would make sure to work with the health department to make sure everything was in compliance at our facility. Should the council wish to amend our zoning ordinances to identify this use to make it either a conditionally permitted use or a permitted use? the following would be the, the practice we would take. We would initiate at the council level a zone text amendment that would modify our local ordinances such as the Malibu Municipal Code. And then we would also need to initiate a local coastal program amendment. And that would be to modify our uh, local implementation plan which is part of our local coastal program. Uh, we would need to make certain that both of those documents are consistent and that would be how we could then uh, begin our, our, our permitting process for this. So these amendments would be initiated by the council. The planning department would then prepare the proposed amendments to the codes and we would, our, our typical route is to present these to our Zoe Races subcommittee. From there, it would go to the planning commission for a recommendation and then the final product <laughs> would come before this council for adoption. Uh, this council could, would then adopt both the ZTA and the LCPA. Once the LCPA has, has been adopted at the council level, 
we would then submit that local coastal program to the California Coastal Commission for their consideration. Uh, staff, we typically group local coastal programs uh, amendments together. So this would most likely get grouped with something else that the city is doing. And the reason for that is that uh, by law, the city is only allowed to submit three local coastal program amendments per year uh, applications. Uh, but each application could have five or six, ten. You, you can you can lump them all together. So we would then submit that LCPA to the Coastal Commission for their consideration. I have reached out to the Coastal Commission just to see kind of what their take was on on this proposition. Uh, however, I've left a few messages and have not gotten a call back uh, as of yet. Uh, we we do have scheduled meetings with them face to face. I'll be bringing this up there. However, uh, this is similar to some of the other permitting they've done up and down the coast. For example, uh, the, the little beach cafe stands you see on LA County beaches, uh, like Zuma has one, for example. Uh, and the Coastal Commission to date has not had a concern with those. I would, to me, this runs at the similar line. I would think that the Coastal Commission, in my opinion, should not have an issue. It's visitor serving. It's it's an amenity for the park. And as I mentioned, they, they've been fine with these being permitted on the beach. So I would think we could do the same uh, on bluffs because, once again, it's a visitor serving area. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, the Snack Shack was not included as part of the adopted budget for the city. Um, if the council does recommend moving forward on this, we would need to also identify a funding source. And this would also be something to consider as we move forward with uh, the city's work plan items. And we are available for any questions, should you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Does anybody on council have any questions before we move to public comment? I have a question. I, I, I'm curious as to why we are allowed only a 25 days to have a facility open in a 90 day period. And uh, during the summer, there are practices and games every day. So why would it only be open for a little more than a third of a little less than a third of them? That is a Department of Public Health um, rule, and so I, that's their permitting process and rules. How is the public health helped by not having food for 65 days out of 90? We can, that's, that's just their rule. I can look into it further. Okay. I'd... Mr. Mayor, may I? Take a stab at answering that question. I'm sorry? Mayor. Uh, oh, <laughs> Mayor. I, all I heard was up there. Um, from my understanding, um, the, the facility probably wouldn't be open the entire area, probably just for game days. We can verify with the Little League if they would be operating it during uh, practices and such but probably just seeing it open maybe Saturday or Sunday, and for the season, 25 days should be more than enough during that 90-day period. I think this is a standard rule that LA County has for their public health of permitting these types of facilities in other areas. Um, there are other permitting types if through LA County if there was a, a need to expand and have more days available for the operations. There may be some modifications to the facility, though, that would be required if it was going to be open on a more permanent basis. Are there any other questions? Paul? Did you? Doug? This is so much dip more difficult than Zoom. <laughs> Zoom We're still getting Android. used to this. Uh, a quick question, uh, Christian, or uh, uh, Richard. The comments that you had about the requirements from the health department, for instance, the triple sink and restrooms within 200 feet, is that only for the permanent facility, or does that apply whether it's a temporary facility like a, a trailer or only for the permanent facility? That's required for a trailer also, temporary facility. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at trying to answer that. I mean, that, that, those would be requirements that would be same for a temporary food facility or a permanent food facility. So um, it's, and I think the, the, one of the questions that I kind of wanted to, sorry, that wasn't your question, but I wanted to maybe follow up a little bit further with staff would be, if it's a permanent facility, I don't believe it, we would be restricted to that uh, 25 days per 90-day period. Uh, it would be, you know, then it could be permitted, you know, much like a, a restaurant or, or any permanent food facility. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, but I didn't quite hear the answer to the question I had. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe the acoustics. If it's a temporary facility, do we need to have the three, the uh, restrooms within 200 feet and all the other requirements, or is that only for a permanent? I believe that's for both facilities. You would have okay, to have thank that you. requirement. Okay, thank you. Richard, I have a question for you, two questions for you. One is, um, do we have any historical precedent for interpreting the words refreshment stands, ice cream stands, and other fixed location outdoor food vending stands? No, I'm not aware of us doing that. Okay. And do we have any precedential interpretation for how we construe the words food vending? No. Uh, I would say the only practice, if you will, or has been answering the question of what is and what isn't a restaurant, but that's all. And restaurants are not food vending, right? Uh, correct. It would be food preparation. Of, you would have to, we've always, uh, the, to my knowledge, I've been here, we've always taken the stance that if you can go somewhere place an order and they prepare, and you wait while they prepare the food specific to that order, we've considered that to be a restaurant, whether it be Subway or, or, or Nobu. And, and what is, what is the, what are the words exactly of the restriction on food, the food vending restriction in this area? It is ice cream stands, or excuse me, Refreshment stands, ice cream stands, or other fixed location outdoor food vending stands. Okay, I, I thought there was a separate thing besides for that that you had mentioned to me. Maybe I misunderstood. I, so if, if it's not refreshment stand, ice cream stand, or other fixed location outdoor food vending stand, it's, it's neither identified as a permitted use or prohibited as a use. But is there some other prohibition on food vending, or is that where you got those words from that you had mentioned to me? Uh, no. The, those those three categories, if you will, come direct from the code. That's okay. all I have. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions? One more. Go ahead, Paul. I, I seem to remember buying freshly made hamburgers at that uh, thing up there at the Bluff Parks several times over the years. Did I commit a crime? No. <laughs> There was, unfortunately, we allowed them to do, to sell and prepare without a health permit permit. So now we need to correct that. And this is why all these requirements are now in order. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before we move to public comment, just w one more clarification, Richard, again. So, for example, um, Mutt's in the um, Country Mart or Lumberyard, whichever that one is. If, if I go to the window there and order a burger, is that a food vending establishment? We would put them under the category of a restaurant. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Public comment. Um, Kelsey, are we doing Zoom first or live first? If you could call the in-person speakers and we'll remind all the Zoom participants to raise their hand and then we'll call them to speak next. Okay. So our first speaker will be Ted Vale. Followed by Dane Scopehammer and Joe Drummond. Well, welcome. It's good to be back with you in front of you. Uh, I've been a resident for 49 years, served on the Parks and Recreation Commission, Planning Commission, Trails Committee, Code Enforcement. And so I, I think I qualify as maybe the resident curmudgeon to be in front of you. and. Uh, I wanted to give a little Malibu history. Uh, at the uh, Parks and Rec, there was a park at Las Flores, so it was just a piece of land that we owned. And so we worked on it, and we ultimately got the plans going for a little park there. It took over 10 years to get it done. Uh, on, we also got a skate park right near 
uh, uh, at, uh, the lumberyard, the Ad Adamont, what, what's it called? Uh, and uh, that uh, went away when the owner said, we're going to have to put another use to this. But you'll get a skate park somewhere. Well, the kids who are using that skate park, their kids are now uh, using the temporary skate park. Uh, it's taken over 20 years to get it done. And it's, it's about done, I think, but not quite done. So my, uh, my point is, do something. Uh, Malibu Film Society, where is it? It's in Agura. Why isn't it here? Do something. You're there to do something. Uh, we have substantial property tax income in the city, uh, much more than we used to have. And the uh, homes are selling for $50 million. You've got a lot of money. Don't worry about $1,000 or $90,000 for the. Do something for the kids. Uh, make sure it's done. I see a lot of examples here. And there are a lot of good ideas. But all I want to say is do something for the kids now. Not five years from now. Not uh, Don't go through a whole list of things and then and have to plan it. Oh, and we only have three of them we can do uh, this month. We have to do it next year. Do something. Thank you, Ted. All right, Dane Scopehammer, followed by Joe Drummond, followed by Howard Rutsky. Hi, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, good to be here in person. Thanks for having us. Uh, I am a lifelong Malibu resident, a father of two young children, and the chair of the Parks and Rec Committee. And I want to believe that when a community can identify a problem, that we can turn to our leadership and ask them for help to fix that problem. Uh, I'm here for you or to ask you uh, for help to fix the snack shack. Uh, I first brought this issue to the Parks and Rec Commission in June of last year. In August, our commission was able to recommend action replacing the old snack shack with a new one. Since then, with the help and advice from the, from the community, the council, the commission, and the city staff, I believe that we have a solution that will work. I would like to recommend that the council do the following. Uh, vote to amend the LCP and allow concessions at the bluffs. Approve $8,000 for the immediate removal of the old snack shack. Allocate $100,000 for a new mobile food service trailer to serve as an interim snap, snack shack. And uh, direct the Parks and Rec Commission to design and improve a new permanent structure. Our, our city has a problem. I believe we have a solution. Let's not sit, in the, sit on this any longer than it has already. We can do something now that will impact the children of this community this season. It would show that we care about our sports programs, our children, and preserving the legacy set by past generations. Thank you. Dane, before you sit down, could, could you repeat what the what your program was? So I can make note. Uh, uh, Parks you, and Rec? No, no, the, the, the four things or five things you identified. Uh, vote to amend the LCP to allow concessions. Approve $8,000 for the immediate removal of the old snack shack. Allocate $100,000 for, for a new mobile food service trailer to serve as an interim snack shack. Direct the Parks and Rec Commission to approve a new permanent structure. Thank you. Yep. Joe, you're up, followed by Howard, and then um, Gracelyn and Imi Lugo. Hi, everyone. Thank you to everyone who's here, the staff and Tracy for checking us all in. I really appreciate that. Um, for 35 years, the Snack Shack has serviced Malibu's young families in providing much needed concessions and bringing together community volunteers. And it should have some grandfathering privileges, and so should the Malibu Film Society, actually, that camping is allowed in Bluffs Park, yet not allowed this historical small structure that has serviced our families is ridiculous. A few changes, I've always said, needed to be made to the LCP. One is we need to change the code not to require variances for every little structure, not adding more than 10% in residential areas that are historically geohazardous areas, so that my neighbors and I can do very small projects at a reasonable cost and time. And you also need to allow the permanent snack shack to return. 
They would not be using more water than normal as the restrooms in the Michael Landon Center would also be used otherwise, and one sink should hardly be a concern. Please change the LCP to not allow camping, but do allow this type of a concession stand to provide this service to our Malibu families, and if it can be fast-tracked, that would be the best. I don't know if that's possible, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Howard, you're next. And then after the children get to speak, Alicia Peak will be the last live public speaker. Good evening, welcome back. This is a perfect example of the citizens, some local business, Richard, the staff, Justine, everybody pulling together for the kids and the kids. The kids, you know, raised 560 something signatures on a petition. And if we can't do this, we look like idiots. We can't do anything. This is for the kids. We need to get a temporary kitchen there tomorrow. We can't have it tomorrow, but we can literally have it in three weeks. And get the kids something. This is a community pulling together. This is everybody. You guys have all worked on it. He's worked on it. They've worked on it. She's worked on it. He's worked on it. A number of people on Zoom's worked on it. And everyone wants it. When 565 people sign a petition, it should tell you something. Please do it. Like the gentleman there that said, just do it. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Okay, Gracelyn and Emmy. Why don't you pull the microphone down? Can I do that? Okay. Dear City, City Council, Council, I am Grace and I am eight. I am A and I am six. We Here just want to say that we want to keep this hash up because it's, it's fun and our favorite part of Little League. We like more than just, we like more food, food than, than just, just candy. candy. Thank you. Okay. Alicia? Is Alicia Peek here? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. My bad. <laughs> no problem. Um, hi, City Council. So nice to see you guys all in person. It's amazing. Anyway, um, First of all, I always want to thank you for all you do. I know how much time and energy you guys put out into this, so I'm just so grateful for each and every one of you. Um, I really want to echo the first man who spoke. I don't know your name, but yes, we need to do something, and like we need to do something tonight. Um, we can't keep waiting. Dane, my fellow commissioner, brought this to the commission last June. We've been talking about this since last June, and we are still in the exact same place we were last June. So please do something and do something tonight. Um, I created a petition on Friday night. I've garnered, I think, um, I sent it to all of you today. I checked right before I came here. We're almost up to 450 signatures. Um, it's just overwhelming the support of this snack shack and what we need. I grew up here. I'm a third generation Malibu resident. I have wonderful memories of eating burgers at the snack shack, my most fond memories. Um, I want that for my children. My children are six and eight. If we continue at this speed, they're lucky that their kids could have a snack shack one day, right? Like we need to do this now. Um, oh, anyway, I'm grateful for all of you. I have three things to ask because I know how slow the bureaucratic process is, which is none of your faults, but I do think that you can try your best to change it tonight. Um, one, we need to immediately request the removal of the current facility that is there. As you saw those beautiful pictures, you know, wouldn't you want to eat out of that thing? I don't think so. Um, we need to change the LCP and amend the table of uses to include this concession stand. This should not be an issue for future generations, and the only way to make it not an issue is to amend and include it in the table of uses. 
We need to allocate $100,000 for the mobile interim food service trailer. Um, that really can be here in two to three weeks. This isn't something we have to wait for their, my kids' kids, right? Like we can do this now and we can do this for this little league season. Um, and everything else that Dane said, he's amazing and I'm so grateful for him. And I'm speaking as a parent and a coach and a Parks and Rec chair and I just believe in this town, I love this town. I've chosen to raise my family here because of the beautiful community. Um, and I think tonight is where we make big changes. So let's do something. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. That takes us to Zoom. Our next speaker is Jake Lingo, followed by Marissa. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. My name is Jake Lingo. I'm a resident of Malibu, father of two school-aged children, Malibu League little league board member who manages two teams, an AOS okay coach and frequent patron at Bluffs Park. Tonight I'm here speaking on behalf of Malibu Little League and our community. <clears throat> I wanna start off by thanking you for your quick and decisive actions taken at the February 27th meeting and instructing staff to bring back proposed options for the snack shack. It was clear to me that the city's leadership values and understands the importance of having a snack shack as part of the Little League experience. Since that time, <clears throat> we've had an opening day and have held multiple games at Bluffs. Much like last year, we've dwindled from three food trucks on opening day down to one on Saturdays and none on weekday games. Average cost of a meal from these trucks is $15 and up. It isn't a sustainable solution. Tonight, we come to you to ask the city council to invest in upgrading your community and find a short-term and long-term solution to this problem by one, funding a food service trailer at Bluffs, while two, the city works through the process of building a permanent snack shack that includes bathroom facilities and storage areas. We ask that tonight you vote in favor of processing a zone text amendment and local coastal plan program amendment to identify the operation of Snack Shack in the public open space as an allowable use at this location. In addition, we ask that an application to modify the existing wastewater allocation for Malibu Bluffs Park be supported by council and the application be submitted. At opening day this year, we honor Doug O'Brien. He was part of Malibu Little League for 27 years and headed up the committee who built the current Bluffs ball fields. Everyone spoke about Mr. O'Brien's dedication to service and to his community. He understood the building community and strong leaders start with the youth and that our children are worth our investment, our time and our effort. The Snack Shack is a vital part of what makes Little League special. If we are not able to provide these basic services and experiences for our youth, we will continue to lose kids to programs over the hill and up the coast. And we don't want that. I will leave you with an excerpt from a piece called Why Little League Matters by John Donaldson. I'm involved because in a world where interactions are increasingly impersonal and indirect, Little League provides a place where kids can have fun, where they can learn important life lessons. It provides a sense of connection across generations, common ground between parent and child, and a reminder of what binds us together as a community and the source of our strength as a nation. With that, we ask the city council to please continue your quick and decisive actions as it relates to the support of the snack shack. Your community is counting on you and we hope that you will step up to the plate for all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jake. Our next speaker is Marissa. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, Good evening, Council Marissa Coughlin. Um, my the history for you that I'm I'm happy happy to give is going to be shorter than my comments, but I do agree with Ted Vale. Do it and do it now. And the reason I say that I was involved in the coastal uh, permit issue with the County of LA when this property was destined to be improved as a youth sports facility. We have two sports there. We have little. Well, we have more. We have little league. We have uh, AYSO soccer, and from 1968 until let me see my 1984, I was president and board member going back and forth of uh, Malibu Little League when it began at the Bluffs Lagoon Park, where the golf course is now. Then it went to Trancas Riders and Ropers, and then it went to Bluff Park. Uh, Mr. Ed Cohen, a, a deceased former resident of 
Malibu Colony paid for the grading, which Doug O'Brien of the Lions Club and the Kiwanis Club had done. All the contractors volunteered their time. Uh, the We were supposed to go into the Bluff Park facility, the Landon building in the county. There was a mess up. They didn't build it big enough. Uh, we won the Youth World Cup in uh, soccer in 93, and we won the Youth Baseball Championship in 94. I'd like to see that signed back up at the Bluff Park. Uh, the reason we had that facility there was because that's how we paid our umpires and our, co our, our grounds people. And then we also gave scholarships for the kids in our community that couldn't afford it. Um, the health department allowed us to operate it in that way. And, and uh, even Dave Riggle, the former health officer for this area, used to come there sometimes at lunch. His wife, Verl, was a um, teacher at the Presbyterian Church. And they would come there sometimes and watch the games and have a good time. Uh, I think this is a critical part of the making of our young adults. I'm, I'm happy to say that both the Peaks and the Scope Hammers were involved in these problems. I'm dating myself, obviously. And uh, my son as well, who now, um, who became our first professional baseball player out of Malibu. And he now is the Vice President of Development for the Utah Jazz NBA basketball team. Having had all this youth experience, we keep our kids off the streets in the bad way. We keep them focused to our family and we keep them and we take pride in them for our community. I don't know what else to say to you, but it's something I agree with all the speakers. Something needs to be done now, temporarily, while we work on permanent and get over this political stuff with the LCP. Just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marissa. Who's next? Mayor, that was the last speaker of this item. That was the final speaker for this item. Okay, you need to speak into the mic a little better. Thank you. Okay, that takes us, that, that will close public comment. That brings us to council. Who wants to go first? I'll take it. Go ahead, Doug. All right. Um, first off, I want to thank the staff. Um, you guys did an amazing job. You turned this around in a month. And it's, I, I know you pushed some uh, things out of the way. Apologize to those people who got put, put behind the curve a little bit. But this was very important. And it's important for all the reasons everybody just said. And uh, to Ted Vale, uh, you're absolutely right. Get it done. Um, just do it. And that's the story of successful businesses. It's going to be the story of a successful city of Malibu on this. Um, I've got a few quick questions uh, to perhaps uh, Richard or Kristen or Steve. I'm not sure who's got the answers to this. Um, first question I have is, can we get water and electricity to this uh, uh, facility on a temporary base? If we had a temporary trailer, is that possible? I mean, it, it looks like it just plugs in. Correct. So electricity, we would have to upgrade um, the electricity at Malibu Bluffs Park where we could plug in. Um, from my research, they explain it as like, it's just kind of like a drier connection. That's the type of wattage you need. Okay. So we would need that upgrade for electrical. Um, water, they, for the trailer, it's a tank. So we would have to, you know, use the holding tank for the wastewater and then the tank for the fresh water. All right. So it's more like a, like an RV then. Okay. Correct. All right. Um, if we, if the city were to have a trailer on an interim basis or, or a regular facility, how do we, how do we plan on operating that? Is it uh, a lease that we give a dollar a month to the little league and AYSO or how does that work? Or do you have an idea yet? I think, the best option would be to add it to our fee schedule, possibly, and we could do that. The city already has a fee schedule for rentals. There are three tiers, a nonprofit, commercial, and community use, but I think that would kind okay. of Trevor can weigh in if that's an option. All right. Uh, that pretty well answers uh, my questions. You guys did a nice job in your presentation. By the way, to the people who spoke, you know, the message loud and clear. Uh, Alicia, whether it's 400 signatures or 550 signatures, that make a difference. You know, it's a town of 10,000 people, and our citizens are speaking on this. For that reason, 
uh, I'd like to maybe uh, start the ball rolling. I'd like to make a, a couple of motions here. And uh, Trevor, fix me when I'm, when I'm off track, all right? Um, two parts. First part is I'd like to make a motion to approve the purchase and operation of a non-permanent food service trailer at a cost not to exceed $100,000. And a second part of that is to demolish the existing uh, snack shack at a cost not to exceed $10,000. The city parks and uh, department will administer the use and operation of the trailer, including the uh, licensing or uh, leasing to any users uh, using Bluff Park. And then the second part I'd like to have, maybe we need two motions for this, authorize the city to develop a long-term plan for a permanent food service and associated facilities, including the preparation of an LCPA. That would be my motion that so, Trevor is going to have to fix. Doug, I'll second the motion for discussion purposes. I imagine we're going to have a lot of uh, yeah. nuanced discussion. But I'd like to start. I'd like to start the ball rolling with that. That's uh, my comments for right now. Thank you, Mayor. Paul, well, go ahead. Frank, good. Okay, uh, I, I'd be glad to vote for both of those, and I'd also like us to, uh, maybe it's a little early to, to also say that our goal is a, is a permanent building, and uh, the, the appropriate zone text amendment and LCPA to allow that to occur. But this, the temporary one is what we're gonna do in the meantime, with the object being to get a permanent building there with permanent bathrooms and the appropriate sewer connections. Those are my thoughts. Okay. I'll go next, unless Steve or Marianne would like to. Go ahead, Steve. I just have a question. What, whatever happened to the Optimus Club trailer that they everybody went out and took a look at? Is that didn't work? Not good? I mean... That's been on city property in a number of, of different venues serving food. Is that not a viable option for this thing? As staff, we were never invited to look at it, so I don't have any details on that facility. Somebody Mr. Went and Mayor? Looked at it. Marianne looked at it, and Adam Howard looked at it. I I believe, whatever happened to it? I believe Dane Scope Hammer um, can answer some of the questions, or Howard, whichever, Howard. if you were inclined to allow them to speak. Come on, Howard. Anybody. We went and looked at the trailer, and it hasn't been used in quite a while. It doesn't have an operating county health permit. It never has. The trailer would need all the mechanicals to be redone. It would need all the electrical to be redone. It needs a fire suppression system to get a county health permit. It needs a hot water system. It needs a refrigeration system. It needs all the grills gone through. It needs the, the hitch on the trailer part to be able to be pulled by like an F-350 or something like that. I got you. That's, so that my question. we don't know how much it will cost. It like, you know, we say forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, open it up, it could be close to what we're asking for for a brand new one. Cool. Thank you. Thank well, you. Okay, thank you. That's it. All right, well, I, I like the, the motion. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the long-term solution, not, not that we don't need to do something immediately, and we do. Um, although I think the long-term solution can actually be a pretty quick solution. Um, that's why I, I was I asked questions earlier about what these terms in our code mean or whether we have interpretive guidance, and we, we don't. Uh, I, don't I don't view a building, perhaps a cinder block building um, or cement, whatever, but, you know, a, a solid building that has restrooms, and has the ability to cook food and serve food as being a refreshment stand, an ice cream stand, or an other fixed location outdoor food vending stand. And I'm satisfied from the answers that Richard gave about restaurants that it's also not food vending, period. Now, I know we don't have authority for a restaurant there either, but I don't, I don't see any, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, 
I think we could right now say that under our existing LCP, and I would still go get an amendment for clarification purposes, not, not for authorization purposes, but I don't see any reason under our existing LCP why we can't have a fixed building there. Not, not, not the, the um, container that was there, but an actual building like you see all over the country in, in good cities that take care of their kids at ball fields. Um, I also think that that's part of a recreation facility. Uh, I could imagine a large building with an indoor pool that has a kitchen inside it and bathrooms inside it with water and sewer and which serves food to the people that come there and they pay to get the food. Uh, I think that would be part of a recreation facility. Indoor tennis courts could have the same kind of thing. That would be a recreation facility. Um, small stadium would have those kinds of things in it. That would be a recreation facility. So. I'd like to see us give direction as the city council that we interpret the code as it stands to permit the construction of such a, a building. Um, my understanding is the building itself would not be non-conforming because buildings can be constructed. Um, so I'd like to see a, I'd like to see us approve an interpretation of the code right now that permits a building that would have to be worked out with the city to build, um, which would have restrooms would have kitchen facilities, uh, could have a window that closes and opens the, to the outdoors where people could go in to get food. I mean, that, that's all design matter. I guess that's, that's beyond my pay grade. But I, I'd like to see us do that. So um, perhaps a friendly amendment to the motions that are on the table that we add to um, going to the Coastal Commission for approval of this interpretation as a new code provision, but, but right now I think we can just interpret the code that way, and I, I would move that we agree to direct the staff to interpret the code that way and start processing whatever permits need to be processed to build that building. Do I get a second for that? I'll second that motion. Would this be a, a since it's the second motion, would it be we do that one first and then oh. go back to the original motion? Actually, I, it was a friendly amendment. I, it's a friendly amendment to the um, motion that we um, work on a long-term plan. So Doug and Doug would have to accept the uh, friendly amendment. I, I accept that. And um, uh, question to Trevor: Should we have this in two motions or just one? Hold on. I think we have to un unwind a little bit what we're doing here to be to be clear. Um, we d we don't have a policy that that was noticed for tonight to put a new policy interpreting interpreting our. Our, our LCP and allowed uses under under the uh, that are allowed in the LCP for this uh, particular parcel that would apply. You're asking for an interpretation that would determine that the sale of food out of this would not constitute food vending or a restaurant. Neither of those is allowed. I, I would strongly recommend that you do go forward with the LCP amendment to amend those uses so that you do not go forward and construct a, um, a facility here that. Coastal is going to, it says is not allowed and doesn't count is is not an allowed use at the at the uh, on the parcel. So I think you should go forward with that. Um, the you know the the permanent structure. Um, the mayor is correct that it's a coastal development permit that would be put forward. So the actual construction of that um, facility does not necessarily need an LCP amendment. It's the use of selling food or operating as a restaurant. If it's considered to be food vending or considered to be a restaurant, that would be what would not be um, allowed under the LCP as it currently stands. So um, I have here the following that you wanted that, that you wanted to um, include in your motion. So I want to go forward and, and, and share with, see if I had that correct about the items that you had listed here. Um, it would be a motion to authorize the city manager to purchase a food service trailer not to exceed $100,000, direct staff to initiate the demolition of the current snack shack at a cost not to exceed $10,000. Um, number three, initiate a local coastal program amendment to authorize a permanent snack shack. And four, return with a proposed plan for the operation of the food service trailer and construction and operation of a permanent snack shack. Are those what you had in your original motion? Does that reflect? You always make it sound better when you read it back, so I'll go with that. It covers everything? Okay. I, I, I don't know that you would have any delay from putting an LCP amendment forward, but you, 
you, you know, there's the, the next step, correct me, Richard, if I'm wrong, is going to have to be the design of the permanent snack shack, which will take time and has to go to the um, Parks and Rec Commission. So you probably want to put a recommendation to have that design go to the Parks and Rec Commission for a recommendation of a, what that would look like. And then you would have to put that design forward. At the same time, the LCP amendment can be moved forward uh, while that design is going forward. Correct, Richard? Yes, the two could be processed concurrently. And you are correct on the path. We need a design. We have to essentially get a conceptual design and we work through all the zoning regulations pertinent to that structure. Okay, well, what I'm hearing is the, the, the only thing we can't do legally right now, perhaps, is give direction to interpret tonight. I, I would actually like to get a consensus from council that when we come back for our next meeting, we put that on the agenda and actually give the staff an interpretive guidance because I don't care that the Coastal Commission might disagree with it. I don't know that they will. And I believe it's a fair, colorable interpretation of the language. And I'd like to put it forward as something for us to be able to vote on. If we can't do it tonight, that's fine. But I'd like to be able to do it two weeks from now if I have support from the rest of the council to do so. I would certainly support that. I think uh, with a, uh, input and guidance from the city attorney, I think that would be good. Is that to bring back a proposed policy for interpretation of the allowed uses relating to a snack shack? To bring back a proposed interpretation that the creation, that the construction of a permanent <laughs> facility that has restrooms and food service capacity with water and sewer is not a refreshment stand, ice cream stand, or other fixed location outdoor food vending stand. Um, and I'm not certain it's a restaurant either. I, I mean, I, I, I want to think about that. We can talk about that. But I, I think that this is a natural part of a recreation facility, especially for a city at its ballparks. And I believe that we have the ability to tell the staff, perhaps not right now, but two weeks from now, go ahead and construe our LCP that way. We'll go ahead and process an amendment that will um, clarify the current language consistent with our interpretation. But um, I believe we have the authority to make that interpretation, and I think that's a fair interpretation. Marianne? I would uh, agree with Mayor Silverstein on that. Um, I think that the fact that Coastal issued a permit for this concession stand and reiterated that, and then um, when they wrote our LCP, they didn't talk about it. They were pretty much silent on it. So I, I agree with you that I think that our interpretation of that, um, we should definitely have a discussion regarding that, and I favor that interpretation. Paul, then Steve. I also favor that interpretation. I've always thought that the Coastal, when they got the ability to write our plan, that they did not uh, approach it carefully. And, and what we have here is a 30-year-old error that needs to be fixed. The other thing I'd like to point out is one of the primary things that people complain about uh, the Mountains Restoration Trust and the, the, the Conservancy is, they invite people to properties to recreate, and yet they don't provide them a place to get drinking water, go to the bathroom, or find something to eat. I'd hate to see our Bluffs Park become one of those places and invite people to your house and not feed them anything. Doesn't make sense. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of both See all the suggestions we've had tonight. Thanks, Paul. And I would say it's not a 30-year error. It's a 30-year oversight. Steve? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got no problem trying to move this forward as fast as we can. Richard, how soon do you think you're going to have a conversation with Coastal? I mean, if, if there's a way to sort of run this past them or to get their perspective of the most effective way to move this thing forward, I'd like to hear that because that may save us trying to do battle with them sometime down the line. I just, they, they are not always accommodating to us. So I, I remember. <laughs> I understand, Council Member Uri. Uh, we are trying to set up an April conversation with them. We're trying to set up a meeting with their staff for next month. Okay, you don't think you can get a meeting with them prior to our next meeting? I'd like to discuss yeah, with I, I I will try. 
I prefer to ask forgiveness than permission. permission. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, I understand, but you go, you go ask for permission. You're going to get wrapped up in red tape, even if they ultimately agree. Okay. Um, the other thing that I, that I was going to say is um, I, I'll support ninety thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars for the temporary um, trailer, but I wonder whether that's really. I mean, we only need this for a year or two, hopefully less. Um, and do we really need to purchase something? Can we lease something uh, at, a, at a substantially lesser cost? And even if we can, I suppose we could always sell this one when we're finished with it, so it's not a $100,000 cost, really. But Steve, you, you look like you have something to say about that. Um, I think you raise a very good point there, Mr. Mayor. We could certainly investigate that and figure out what's the, what's the best you know, cost benefit there towards the city. And, and, but yeah, we could look at leasing versus purchase options. I mean, which, which, I whatever, whatever it is, it, as long as it gets us here in the next week or two at the most. Correct. Howard, I'm sorry, we, we, we ended public comment. Yeah. Is, it, is there a way to subsidize one of these food trucks? I mean, it sounded to me the food truck can provide the food is just expensive. I mean, as opposed to paying 100,000 bucks, can we give these guys, I don't know, 25 grand and have them up with lower prices and service the people. I don't know. I mean, that just may be another way to get there. Yeah, I, and I don't have to buy the truck. I don't have to buy the the. the uh... I, I was persuaded from hearing the parents speak last time that a, a third party vendor is really not a viable solution. It, it prevents the kids from being involved in the process and in, in the the food service and in the accounting. It, it's just hiring somebody to come provide food, and they don't need someone to just come provide food. They need. A full service for the for the for the for the um, kids, Marianne. I just wanted to add, you know, um, if we were to purchase this food truck, I think it's something that we should consider that we could use it for possible other uses, emergency uses. If we do have some type of fire, flood, other emergency, it could be something that the city could put that through. Um, you know, maybe we could set up eventually when we're back fully staffed, um, maybe some cooking classes or things like that for our community, going out to the high school or other schools, um, setting it up through, through community services. So I think there are some other options um, for a long-term use of this particular trailer if we were to acquire it. Are there any other comments? Steve? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just two quick things. Um, one, it would be rather difficult, I think, for us to quickly turn around that interpretation item and bring it back in two weeks. We could certainly bring it back in a month. Uh, I'd like to be able to focus that time on, on getting moving on the, the other parts of the, uh, of the motion here that, that council's uh, uh, looks likely to uh, approve here tonight. So if you could give us to the 24th to come back with that interpretation, I think that would give us enough time to get it done. It's just, it's a real scramble to get that done. What, what does it take to put on a piece of paper what we already articulated orally? I, I don't know. I'd have to defer that to the city attorney. Can you turn a report I mean, around a couple of days? The, the new ex agenda comes out, you know, at the end of the week and staff's got to put together the report and look into the issue and provide analysis to the, the council on it. Uh, I, I just don't want to see Foot dragging. I don't mean it's, it's not foot days. dragging. The, the longer that time passes, the more problems get raised by people, which can be avoided by acting quickly. So uh, true. I'd like to see us act quickly. Well, I, as it's been stated, this is a, a 30 year mistake or an oversight. I, I want to make sure that we get it correctly when we bring it back to council. The, the other thing that I just wanted to mention while I had the floor, I'm sorry, oh, that's okay. is uh, perhaps uh, the council could consider. Um, just I want to make sure that we have enough cushion on the, to move forward on that. So maybe as part of the motion, uh, if the makers would consider uh, um, increasing that budget for the trailer to $120,000, just to make sure that we have enough to, uh, and that would be so that we can get all the, the hookups and, and uh, connections as well. Marion, you had a comment? Uh, with regards to the interpretation, um, I think we could, with the moving on the the temporary, we're we're solving the the short term issue right away. I think maybe if we do give staff a little bit more time till the twenty fourth to allow them to do that complete analysis, that would be appropriate. Um, we're still taking care of this year's issue and finding a balance for our staff. Um, maybe I I would be comfortable with one hundred thousand for the trailer, but maybe bumping up or creating another allocation 
the $10,000 for the removal, maybe we make that 15 or 18,000 for the site preparation, which includes removal and then setting of any required utilities. Does that sound appropriate? Yep, that, that would be sufficient. If that would be they, an amendment. What about 125 to do whatever is needed for the two things? I would like to separate out the two different items so that we're allocating monies separately for each type of thing. One is the acquisition of trailer. It keeps it clean of exactly what the costs are for that. And then the separate site money for the site uh, cleanup and preparation uh, for the future um, so, use and location of that temporary area. Okay, so what, what's the friendly amendment in terms of the 100,000 cap that had been proposed by Doug? I would say 100,000 for the temporary trailer and then um, I'm looking to staff, do we think for removal of the existing cleanup and setting of the utilities and any other items is 15, 18? What? I th the removal is about eight and then con I don't know if we're going to put concrete pad or if we're just going to set it back on the dirt. Somewhere. Can we ask the public works director if he's got any... Thoughts on these? I'm going to kneel down over here. <laughs> so, uh, um, hundred thousand for the trailer, and then I would expect another twenty, twenty-five thousand for all, all the prep work, all the utilities, just to have enough. I'm going to be seeing a lot of increase in price on kind of all that work lately, and so I think that is a pretty conservative number. Uh, we want to make sure we have enough authorization from the council to move forward on doing that, that work. So that amount should be sufficient to do what we need to do. You say 25, and that includes the demo, or, is for, or just yeah. for site prep? Yes, 25. Yeah. Look, what I would say is the city manager's telling us 125 would be a nice cushion. In the grand scheme of things, I mean, $100,000 is real money, but for the city it's not a huge amount of money, but the $25,000 delta is a drop in the bucket. Let's let's have the authority so it doesn't slow things down. Hopefully the city won't spend the money, but it'll have that cushion and not have to come back and have another meeting with authorization to go higher if it does end up costing more. That would be my proposal. I'll take the uh, baton here and say a friendly amendment is accepted at $25,000 for the uh, uh, site prep and demolition, demolition and uh, extra construction, and staying at one hundred thousand for the for the. Uh, one hundred thousand in the trailer, twenty-five thousand. You're, you're okay. You turned yourself off. Is there any further discussion before we vote? If I could just make my general comments, I haven't yeah. made any. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I just want to thank the community. Uh, they really stepped up. They made their. Um, voices heard on this. They were very clear and they gave us great direction um, as they want us to focus on this attention in this matter. And so I just want to thank all the community members and everybody else that has um, done the labor and uh, brought the information forward. Um, I know Dane's been working on this and he's, uh, he's ready to move this on to the next subject. Um, are we authorizing the um, permanent building to be reviewed by the Parks and Rec Commission to make a recommendation uh, for what needs to be done there as part of this? Maybe it makes sense direction. to keep that until we do the interpretation in four weeks. I, I was going to suggest you, if, if you want to get it to the Parks and Rec Commission, you could say that uh, have consult. Staff consult with the Parks and Rec Commission regarding the design of the permit snack shack. You can put that into this motion if you want to. And then they can start reviewing that they now. They can start moving on that. I mean, it, 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 today you can initiate the LCP amendment. We're bringing back the interpretation. That's just another way. Either way, you're planning on having a, a path forward to authorize a permanent snack shack, so then the work should start moving on the permanent snack shack after this meeting. And then... Doug, is that acceptable? It's acceptable to me. Let's let's Can go. Can I read that. it back when you're yeah. ready? And I think you want to add the uh, phrase on the trailer. Uh, Council Member Stewart, your microphone. I just thought I had the button down. There we go. Can we add the uh, um, wording to have the staff move as quickly as possible on the trailer? Just put just put that in a sense of urgency. Yep. Thank you. 
All right, so I'll accept that as a, as a friendly amendment as well. Okay. I just, I just want to, Marianne, did you have further comments? Okay. I just, I just want to, lesson is when, when the staff does um, consider both the interpretation and the, um, propose, the potential LCP amendment, I, I would encourage you to stay away from the words concessions, stands, and vending. So let's, let's just focus on um, recreation facilities, restrooms, food service, food prep. Okay, looks like we're ready for vote. Trevor, you want to articulate the motions that are on the table so I, we know what we're voting for? I, I would. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe the motion is to, uh, one, authorize the city manager to act as fa fast as possible to purchase a food service trailer not to exceed $100,000. Two, direct staff to initiate the demolition of the current snack shack and site cleanup preparation slash preparation at a cost not to exceed $25,000. Three, initiate a local coastal program amendment to authorize a permanent snack shack. Four, return with a proposed plan for the operation of the food service trailer and construction and operation of a permanent snack shack. Five, have staff consult with the Parks and Recreation Commission regarding the design of the permanent snack shack. And six, bring back an item for discussion of a policy or interpretation of the allowed uses of Bluff Park related to the snack shack within the next month. Okay, I, I hate to complicate this but one thing. Doug, I, I think that we should have a deadline for getting that um, temporary trailer in place. Um, it can always be extended if it has to be, but it, without a deadline, there's there's no goal line. Um, so I don't know what a reasonable deadline is, but we need that there sooner than later. So, Paul? Uh, Council Member Grisanti. I'm sorry. Uh, as I understand it, the, the trailer prompt is something that is built to order and they can do it pretty quickly. I'm trying to remember what, how quickly, Howard, do you know how quickly this thing could be done? I've just been texting with... <laughs> I've just been texting with the gentleman and it seems that we can do it fairly quickly, probably in two to three weeks. If we call them tomorrow, I've already emailed Mr. McClary and Richard the information for the gentleman, and I'm more than happy to, happy to step in because when I texted him back, I said, remember our conversation? Then he sent me a picture of some glorified something, he said between 80 and 150,000, and I told him, keep it at 80,000, thank you. So I'm fairly good at negotiating, so I can help. But if we get him something tomorrow, he'll start. He wanted us to go up to Fairfield, California, wherever that is. I looked, it's 400 miles away. I don't think we have to go there. I think that, you know, he just sends us pictures. Yeah, they're really cool looking. They're Airstream looking. He can put a surfboard on top that says Malibu Snack Shack on it. You know, I told him we want hot dogs, hamburgers, and french fries, and drinks, and he's cool with it. So is 30 days a reasonable amount of time? Uh, how long? 30 days? I'd say 45 days. Okay. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in the interim, though? I mean, we need an interim interim solution. Say that again? An in we need it. Yeah, I'm seriously. We need you have the food trucks there now that they don't like. <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to do interim? We'll do whatever you want. Dane, you got, okay, any, how Dane, you got any ideas? Excuse me. With all, with all respect, Howard, that, that question wasn't for you. Oh, sorry. That was for council. Go for it. <laughs> Let's go with May 15th as a target date. How's that? What date? 45 That's 45 days. Okay. Are they, are they using a tent in the interim, even though they're not supposed to be? And we can just turn a blind eye to that? Um, they are selling prepackaged food, which is approved by the health department permit. <laughs> well, if someone has any uh, ideas, not, not this moment, but if someone has any ideas that can be done on a more interim basis to allow the children to start doing what they want to do here. Um, you know, bring them to the city and we'll see what we can do. Let's vote. Can I, uh, can I add the, uh, the datum to repeat the motion? Um, the motion would then be to one, authorize the city manager to act as fast as possible, targeting May 15th to purchase a food service trailer not to exceed $100,000. 
Two, direct staff to initiate the demolition of the current snack shack and site cleanup slash preparation at a cost not to exceed $25,000. Three, initiate a local coastal program amendment to authorize a permanent snack shack. Four, return with a proposed plan for the operation of the food service trailer and construction and operation of a permanent snack shack. Five, have staff consult with the Parks and Recreation Commission regarding the design of the permanent snack shack. And six, bring back an item for discussion of a policy or interpretation of the allowed uses of Bluff Park related to the snack shack within the next month. Trevor, so, if you, I didn't hear you say it'd be delivered by May 15th. I thought you said targeting. You want to say um, delivered. delivered by May 15th? Okay. I made the change. It says targeting. I, I added delivered by May 15th. Okay. okay. Does anybody have an issue with voting at this moment? Kelsey, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamiri? Yes. Motion carries. That's great. Thank you all. Okay, so that takes us back to 1A ceremonial presentations. We have a presentation on the 2022 Environmental Programs Accomplishments. And that was going to be um, Yolanda. Good evening, City Council. This evening I have the pleasure to share with you our environmental programs accomplishments for the year 2022. As you know, our environmental programs carries out the city's environmental stewardship re responsibilities of the water quality, sanitation, in addition to sustainable programs and ordinance. Next slide, please. So meet your team. Your environmental group is comprised by three members. Our environmental programs manager, Tracy Rosin, we have, she has been here at Weta City since 2003. Tracy has a bachelor's in science in organization leadership. We also have Mark Johnson, our environmental coordinator. He joined the city in 2018, and he's responsible for a lot of our stormwater inspections and clean water reporting. He has a bachelor's in science environmental uh, degree with an emphasis in water quality and hazardous waste. And our newest addition to the team is Karen De La Cruz. She was hired in 2021, and her focus right now is in education outreach of our programs, Solid Waste. She has a bachelor's in science and environmental studies. She's our environmental analyst. We also have a current open position for an environmental analyst which we're hoping that we can fill the vacancy very soon. Next slide, please. In February of this year, our environmental subcommittee directed us to look into other jurisdictions and research environmental programs and their associated staff levels. The purpose of this study was to analyze the amount of staffing and environmental programs of local cities with a similar demographics. We reached out to about 10 cities, and we found out that the city of Malibu operates 14 environmental programs and is currently has three full-time staff members. In comparison, Calabasas and Westlake, as you see in your graph, operate with less, operate less programs with, less, with more outside consultant assistance. One important item to mention is that as a coastal city, Malibu environmental program staff must follow ocean standards under the area of a special biological significance, better known as ASBS, by the State Water Resources Control Board. Next slide, please. This is a copy of our fiscal year work plan for 2022-2023. We have been diligent working on multiple programs in our work plans. As you know, City Council provides staff with an annual work plan, and that's what, how we dedicate our time. In addition to this task, 
Staff coordinates ongoing programs and projects, including energy, pollution prevention, coastal, waste conservation, waste reduction, and events and outreach. The work plan does not include our daily operations and the workload of the environmental programs. What I'm, I'm trying to say is we do stormwater inspections, elicits discharges, legislation compliance, and general reporting and administration that is not included on the work plan. Next slide, please. There are six focus areas that we concentrate on, 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 on environmental programs. We have energy, water conservation, pollution prevention, waste reduction, coastal events, and outreach. This evening, we'll be presenting to you the energy focus area. This will be the first of six environmental focus areas presentation that we will be providing you. The importance of the energy focus is to create a sustainable environment while we are doing our part as our community to reduce greenhouse emissions and our carbon footprint. Our goal is to continue to be the lead in energy and to promote a more sustainable way of living. In the next council meetings, you, we will be presenting to you the following uh, focus areas. Next slide, please. So let's start with energy. I will pass the presentation to Karen now. Thank you, Yolanda. Good evening, City Council, Mr. Mayor. Good to be here. So we'll be beginning with Clean Power Alliance. So in 2017, Malibu joined Clean Power Alliance along with 30 cities from LA and Ventura counties. Initially, council approved the default tier of 15% renewable energy, electricity, excuse me, for Malibu residents and businesses. Then in 2019, council approved to increase that default tier to 100% green power, which then went into effect in October 2020. City staff makes it a key effort to keep up with the sustainability measures by maintaining its partnership with CPA and to provide our residents the best energy savings possible. Uh, our, over the years, we've been able to offer and provide residents energy and financial incentives, such as the battery energy storage and smart thermostats incentive, as well as the Green Leader Program. More recently, in December 2022, the CPA board approved a three long-term renewable power purchase agreements and approved two renewable PPAs with Pivot Energy to provide 100% green power and bill discounts. Now, Clean Power Alliance looking forward, as of uh, 2020, February 2023, Malibu's overall participation is about 95% and 96.6% .6 of those Malibu participants are receiving green power. Moreover, there are 6,969 active Malibu households enrolled in CPA's Green Energy Initiative, which equates to be about more than half of Malibu's population. City staff also attends regular monthly CPA board of directors meetings to address any comments or concerns um, and then report those CPA updates to city management. Some energy updates we look forward to offer this year to our residents is uh, during the March meeting that just passed, the board adopt and adopted and approved the 2023 interim rates, option three. Uh, this was for the approval of a 1% total bill discount for residents with 100% green power, which will benefit the majority of Malibu households and increase overall participation. The interim rate change final adoption will be fully implemented January, uh, July 1st, 2023, in which Malibu customers will be able to see that discount in their monthly bills. Also, we know that this program is forever evolving and changing. They just uh, got news that CPA will be issuing a prepaid green bond. And with that is the bond issued for about 1 billion to expected to reduce CPA's renewable energy costs to customers by approximately $66.7 million over the initial eight year period of that bond, which equates to about 8.3 million annually. And to close it out, we would like to acknowledge that this year marks CPA's fifth year of service, and we will continue our strong partnership 
with CPA and look forward to more reductions to energy costs for residential customers in the future. And I'll go have more of the presentation to Yolanda to talk about Dark Sky. To give you an update and an overview of Dark Sky Ordinance, one of the items we have been working on is Dark Sky, which aims to preserve Malibu's night sky. The outdoor lighting fixtures requirements includes the light fixture must be fully shielded and must have a low color temperature. As you all know, the compliance deadline for the commercial, multifamily, and residential sectors was last year, October of 2022. The staff has been diligently working to notify community by hosting virtual presentations, updating city web pages, publishing print ads, posting social media, and mailing postcards. In addition, we have partnered with Manta's publications. They provide us with posters highlighting the impact of the light pollution in our local fauna. These posters have been distributed to our post office, to our grocery stores, our schools, and our city facilities. Next slide, please. So what is the status of our gas station compliance? As you remember, in August of 2022, Council adopted an amendment to allow a light trespass limit for commercial industrial zones properties onto the public right away. Currently, we have one station that is under compliance, which is Chevron and Civic Center. One project is still under planning review and will be presented on the Planning Commission in their next meeting. This is the Heather Cliff uh, gas station. And the rest of the other four uh, gas stations under plan check review and their building and safety, and we're hoping soon to give uh, permits. So we ha will have those under compliance. Next slide, please. I'm happy to report that the city facilities are fully in compliance, and we are currently focusing all of our efforts with working with various commercial property owners to bring them into compliance. Next slide. So as we look forward and what we're working right now and focusing is in the hope of having 100% commercial compliance and how we're gonna be accomplishing this. The goal is that we have acquired a lighting engineer to enforce the light, the city dark skies ordinance for commercial properties. We are preparing and working towards educational, prop educating property owners, commercial property owners on the city dark sky ordinance and explains how this ordinance will be enforced. In addition to this, we will also do site visits with staff and the lighting engineer to the commercial properties. We're set to start the site visits in the next two weeks, we're doing 20 meetings with different commercial owners to educate them and also to continue emphasizing the importance of being in compliance with this ordinance. After the meeting, the goal is, will be to have a summary and a follow-up action for each one of the meetings with the property owners. Next slide, please. We also have been working on electrical vehicle charging station permit streamline. As you may recall, AB 970 was brought to you on January 9th of 2023. We adopted an ordinance that conforms with the statewide timeframes. This ordinance required the streamline of our review processes. As part of the EV charging applications, we are expediting and created a guidelines and a special checklist to help assist, assist with this permitting process. Next slide, please. Looking forward for the uh, electrical vehicle charging permitting for commercial uh, uh, businesses, the city continue to assist applicants on the processing. We are, we are required to have a deadline of five working days for review. And at this time, uh, what we look for is, is for the infrastructure on the electrical conduits and also the requirements for accessibility and green building code requirements. 
Next slide, please. This concludes our presentation, and this is, as I mentioned, the first of five more presentations to you so we can uh, share with you all of the items that we have been working on this past year. Thank you so much. Thank you, and sorry to make you stay much later than you originally anticipated. My pleasure. Does anybody have any questions or comments? No. Thanks again. Okay, that takes us to communications from public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. Um, and remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item. The first person we have here is Jefferson Wagner. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Thank you very much for your participation uh, and to the benefit of our community, your time and experience is welcomed. And that last decision that you made, I think was valuable for everybody to see that your government is available to work for you. If you get four or 500 votes, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, I was also going to see if you could uh, add to the adjournment file names. Uh, recently, we lost a 40 year resident, Rick Hogson. I met with his daughter today, and uh, he lives on Gray Fox. He's a property owner there for 40, 45 years, and uh, a great community member, a local surfer, and uh, an advocate for the environment. So I would like to see if you could consider adding his name at the adjournment. Additionally, uh, I would like to remind you that the grants program is coming up, the awards. Um, I have been a member on the board of directors at the Adamson House Foundation for the last two decades, and we have a grant application in for funds for the review and the survey of the water uh, at uh, Malibu Lagoon. Please honor that request uh, with your ANF committee. It will be valuable for everybody up and down the coast. We're losing soil and nourishment of those soils is being diminished. You're seeing that effect at Broad Beach and other beaches up and down. Additionally, this survey will be done at a high water time with these unusual rains that we've had. The last surveys have been at very low water content in the lagoon. This is a new litmus, a new value that we can add. This process will also be used by the Topanga uh, Bridge project, which just earned another $5 million of state funds for that project. It additionally can help the people up at Trancus with that bridge understanding and why they have never really reached all of the bedrock for that bridge. And it just keeps going on and on and on. So if you can understand the geology of it, when the soils come down out of the canyons, they are alluvium and that mixes with the sand and that's what keeps our beaches beaches. So this valuable survey is coming up and I hope you'll vote in favor of it. Thank you very much, Council. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jefferson. Norm Haney, you're next. I should say before, followed by Doug Burge, followed by Howard Redsky. Good evening, uh, honorable uh, council members and mayor. Uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for um, starting again the in-person meetings uh, and as well as the Zoom meetings. It's kind of like uh, uh, the best of both worlds. And I appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank you for your service. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much time uh, being a city council member takes. It's, it's not just the time you spend here. You spend probably 20 to 30 hours a week working on city business. And I definitely appreciate it, and I think the people out there listening to this would also appreciate it if they realized how hard you work and how much effort you put into making decisions. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Norm. Doug Bird, you're up. Yes, good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to bring up uh, unattended consequences. Two weeks ago, there was a hearing that was before you for an appeal from a planning commission meeting. 
and it really had to do with PVDs, which is a private view determination. And the unintended consequences was, is that the system is set up now where the results of that meeting, and by the way, the results were very valid. We were supporting even Mr. Mullica's suggestion that the neighbor should have a PVD and a right to have that. It all comes down to really timing, because if you think about it, if you're hiring an architect, and maybe one day you might hire me, Bruce, to be your architect, um, to remodel your house, you ask us one of the first things we do is we check on PVDs. We say, where are the local, where are they? Where are they registered right now? So I have an idea, like this is going to be a two-story house, one-story, 18 feet, whatever. We'll check that out. The problem is, is that there's no timetable to set up when one can issue that. It happened to be in that case where it was literally a day before the hearing, which in some cases the hearings are two years after you've actually designed something. So I'm just not here to state an issue. I'm here also, I'm in the business to solve problems. So I kind of came up with what I think could be a solution is that any homeowner who's paying money and paying fees to design something, they should have an opportunity to know what are the rules that they're dealing with? Not just the codes, but things like PVDs, private view determinations in this case, um, where we're suggesting that you might have an application for somebody is making um, an intent to design something on a property and you're asking to send notices out to the 300 foot homeowners at that time with your neighbors. And so they would have a chance, let's say in 60 or 30 days or whatever the amount of time is, to come forth with the PVD. You'd be surprised, I can point to them alone, there's maybe only a small percentage of people that actually have that. And so one can't expect to spend the money, hire the architects, engineers, and design something without knowing what all those rules would be. So we're just asking that the planning department look at this and consider maybe putting some notice out so someone has X amount of time to submit that PVD, especially in this case where we waited over two years, or in the case of four years, by the time it was appealed, and now we have to go and change the plans. Not that we're not going to change the plans, we need to because of this determination. So it's just a, a consequence of this. So it's just acting in due process and having a system set up where we know the rules when you, want, you start out on a project and do something, and then they don't come later at the last minute. So it's just an issue that I think needs to be solved. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Howard? Your last live speaker tonight, or in person, I should say. Could I speak if I was dead? Joking. Wow. Okay, you guys did something tonight that was unexpected and much appreciated. And this is like the old Malibu acted. This is like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. You guys have a lot of great opportunities, and especially look who's up here. You have Marianne, who knows more about the city. You have Doug, knows about banking. Bruce, lawyer. Steve was on the planning commission, knows more about this town than most people. Paul, I can tease him, but why not? <laughs> Paul, you know, he's been on many commissions and been around much longer than me. And then you got, you know, staff. Richard calls me back at 9 o'clock at night. Rob calls me at 8.30 driving home. Yolanda calls me at 8.30. Look at the talent that these people could do. You know, I think they just need to be appreciated. They need to have encouragement. And we can do anything. There's ways to get back people we've lost. There's ways to do things even greater than what we did tonight. And I know we can do it. We just all have to come together and do it. There's a way to do something. There's a way to choose the option not to do it and figure out how not to do it. In my world, I've always figured out how to do it. I don't get up in the morning knowing how to do it, but I have a lot of great people around me and we figure it out. We've never failed at anything. And if you want to, you can, if you don't, you won't. And this group of people here are citizens. We need a town that we can be proud of. We need a town that we have activities so we don't have to go to Santa Monica and Calabasas. So there's big things to do. I think everyone can do it. Let's just do it like that gentleman said earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. That takes us to Zoom.
Mayor, we do not have any raised hands for this item in Zoom. Okay, thank you. That will take us to commission, committee, and city manager updates. Do we first of all have any commission or committee updates? Okay. What is this for? Oh, we still have another. Oh, Joe Drummond, Public Works update. Hello, Honorable City Council, Mayor Silverstein. I'm here on behalf of the Public Works Commission regarding some immediate requests. So the first thing is there's a general and growing consensus in Malibu that the city play a more active role in mitigating growing threats to our community and quality of life as we struggle to recover from Woolsey, bring back the residents we lost, and form our own school district. Foremost among these would be addressing the skyrocketing cost of fire insurance, which threatens to drive many res residents from Malibu while making it unaffordable for others. It behooves the city to work with a large insurance company to secure reasonable fire insurance protection for all residents. This would be good for property values, for neighborhoods, for fire safety generally, and to maintain our character as a family community. We personally were just hit with a $13,000 fire insurance bill from travelers that we could not conscionably renew. So if you can instruct perhaps Steve McClary, our city manager, to research this, this would be a good start. Similarly, there are a number of items that have come up during our meetings regarding the structure and purpose of assessment districts, namely those which the city inherited from Los Angeles County dealing with the issue of dewatering. All of these districts are formed are more than 40 years old and none of them have solved the problem for which they were formed. Assessment districts are intended to solve problems within the allotted, an allotted period of time. They are not and have never been intended to be generationally ongoing. Certainly some of these problems pertain to the county authorizing the overdevelopment of certain areas in Malibu, whereas others relate to general stability issues in the Santa Monica Mountains, both which could at any time impact other neighborhoods throughout the city. We believe that one, the assessment districts were rushed into a solution that wasn't fully researched and further investigation is necessary to find a permanent solution. Two, the city should research alternative arrangements giving, given the landslide mitigation impacts, not only impact specific neighborhood, but our own thoroughfares like PCH. And three, that the use of independent contractors actually works against solving our problems as contractors typically benefit from perpetuating their work indefinitely. We call upon the city to develop a plan, ideally in conjunction with public works, which is fully staffed and functioning well with Rob, to investigate alternative structures to assessment districts which would better address these problems as they exist now and may exist in the future. We also call upon the city to reconsider development and septic increases in such areas if a permanent solution is not possible, including but not limited to permitting of ADUs, rehab facilities, and in increased footage rebuilds and remodels. Therefore, I'm formally asking you to expand our commission's work assignment beyond review of maintenance and monitoring of assessment districts to include evaluation of assessment district efficacy and consideration and recommendation of alternate approaches to assessment districts, both specifically Thank and generally. Jill. By being able to explore these options can allow us to find a Jill. better, more efficient, and more cost-effective approach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other no other commission updates. Okay, that takes us to the city manager update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, first, it's uh, great to see everybody back in chambers and uh, nice to move forward with a hybrid format uh, and appreciate everybody who showed up for the reception this evening. Uh, also wanted to give a, a, a quick uh, wish, a, actually a happy birthday to the city of Malibu. Uh, tomorrow will be the official birthday of the city. We incorporated on uh, March 28th, 1991. So uh, happy 32nd birthday to the city of Malibu. Also want to report on some upcoming events. Um, first off, uh, April 1st and April 2nd, this weekend, we're gonna be celebrating the 23rd annual Chumash Day, Native American uh, powwow and intertribal gathering. Uh, that will be at uh, Malibu Bluffs Park, uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, both days. Uh, there is complimentary admission and free parking at shuttle. 
uh, on Civic Center Way. Also wanted to report uh, and announce that uh, there's a, uh, we, we do have a date now, and I think most people are aware for the official ribbon cutting for the new Santa Monica uh, College campus. Uh, that's going to be April 22nd, Saturday, April 22nd, uh, beginning at 10 a.m. Uh, so there is going to be a ribbon cutting uh, ceremony, uh, followed by uh, some uh, some dignitaries will be speaking, including I believe we have the mayor I think lined up for that, uh, and then there will also be an open house uh, for the community as well uh, that day. Uh, also working on uh, the state of the city event uh, that's going to be coming up on May third at 10 a.m. Uh, that event is also scheduled to occur at the uh, new Santa, Santa Monica College Malibu campus. Uh, moving on, um, finally got a little bit of a break from uh, all, the, uh, all the rainy weather, which I think everybody are, is happy to see. Uh, so far uh, in Malibu, I think we've done relatively well throughout all these uh, storm events. We've uh, had some issues with local street flooding and whatnot, um, and some occasional interruptions of, uh, of uh, you know, traffic on canyon roads as they uh, clear rock and debris. But uh, we've really uh, come out, I think, relatively uh, good throughout all the storms. Of course, we're expecting a little bit more moisture this week. Um, also wanted to note that as a, a part of this, obviously with, with all the rainfall, a little more concern uh, due to potential soil erosion and runoff. So i um, happy to report that our, our building safety staff, they've identified about a dozen sites uh, throughout the city, uh, and they've been uh, continuing to uh, monitor those locations uh, as we go through the winter storms. Hopefully coming to an end on that. I wanted to report that um, uh, the mayor and I uh, did attend a, a meet and greet uh, with Supervisor Lindsay Horvath uh, last week. Uh, we met in her office down in downtown Los Angeles, so I think it was a very positive meeting and uh, got to share with the supervisor uh, some of Malibu's concerns and the issues that we're working on. Uh, and I think she was very uh, open uh, to hear what, what our concerns were and, and, uh, and everything that's, that's happening in Malibu. Um, so that was a very positive meeting, I'm happy to report. I uh, also wanted to note um, uh, that uh, we are working on finalizing an agreement uh, with the school district for a, uh, for a daytime impound lot uh, for towed vehicles this summer. Uh, so that agreement would allow the use of the high school. Uh, so um, we should have that finalized here soon. Uh, and that'll uh, get us an operation from, uh, should be from Memorial Day through, uh, through Labor Day. So happy to report that. I uh, also want to note that we uh, have closed recruitment on a couple of our department head positions, both the community services director and the deputy city manager. Uh, we did a full open recruitment for both of those positions, and we will be uh, holding interviews uh, for both of those positions soon. Uh, and then in terms of the next council meeting uh, for April 10th, uh, I know many um, on the council and many uh, members of the public have been uh, eagerly awaiting for an item to come back to council, and I'm happy to report that we will have a discussion on, on fractional ownership, uh, commonly referred to as the Picasso model. Uh, so that will be coming to the council at the next regular meeting for discussion and direction. Also at the next meeting, we'll be bringing forward an item for council to consider uh, supporting uh, a, a assembly bill. Uh, that uh, um, we have been working with um, several lo local officials here have been working uh, with our consultants with Cal Strategies uh, and working with Assemblymember Irwin's office uh, to get a bill introduced to extend the property tax exemption for homes that were lost in the Woolsey fire. Uh, as many are aware, there is a, a five-year ex exemption uh, for homes that are lost uh, in a disaster like that. And uh, we are seeking this bill to get uh, adopted uh, in this legislative session, uh, along hopefully with an urgency ordinance so that it could take effect uh, before January 1st of this year. That would extend the property tax exemption for those properties for an additional three years. Um, so we're working with the Assembly Member Irwin's office on that. Uh, also uh, appears that the, the bill is also looking like it will 
is picking up support from the uh, town or the city of Paradise as well. Uh, so we will be bringing that forward at the April 10th meeting uh, for the council to consider support of that bill. Also for that uh, date, uh, we will be bringing forward for the um, homeless task force, a charter review uh, and recommendation from the task force on enforcement priorities. Uh, that is the extent of my report. I, I did want to uh, quickly uh, introduce, or for those who didn't get a chance to meet him during the break, but uh, Sergeant Chris Soderland uh, with the Lost Hills Station is here this evening. Uh, Chris, I didn't know if you were wanted to say any any words this evening, but uh, I'll give you an opportunity if you would like to do so. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sergeant Chris Sutherland. I'm your new uh, liaison for the city and the community uh, with the Sheriff's Department. Um, I've been on the Sheriff's Department for 15 years now. Last three years I've been assigned at Lost Hill Sheriff Station. Um, I've done everything from patrol sergeant, watch sergeant, watch commander, beach team sergeant. So um, I've been around for a little bit and done pretty much everything there is to do at the station. So I'm happy to be here. Um, two items that the captain wanted me to uh, reiterate to you, uh, especially with what happened today in Nashville. Um, the captain wanted me to reiterate, reiterate the uh, sheriff's department commitment to public safety especially with schools. We have our own um, sergeant who's assigned full-time to schools uh, as part of the J team, as well as three deputies. And uh, to that extent, they've uh, gone to all the schools in the districts and done safety assessments on school campus and their safety protocols, as well as um, redesigned the school response uh, safety program to those schools. And the other um, topic the captain wanted me to talk to you about was uh, they are starting a working group with clergy from all denominations about uh, safety as it relates to uh, worship services and uh, church properties. So we'll be starting that as well. Uh, once again, thank you. And you'll be seeing a lot more of me. So pleasure. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions of Sergeant Sutherland? Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions of the city manager? Okay. Um, does anybody want to take a break before we do the um, council reports, or should we move forward? Looks like we're ready to move forward. Okay. So that takes us to um, city council member meeting attendance reports and inquiries. Who would like to present their report first? Hey, Paul. Uh, I had the great pleasure of attending the opening of the uh, the uh, photography exhibit that you saw as you came in here yesterday. And uh, I can't thank uh, Kristen and her team enough for the way they have worked with the Arts Commission. And they've put this on. It really is a wonderful thing. And I, I urge everyone to attend. It's, uh, you know, the, the work that we've had is very interesting. And uh, we've got more great things coming, and it's really worth paying attention out there in, in uh, Zoom land and make a point of showing up for these things. And they will even give you cookies if you show up and sandwiches. So it's really, really quite good. Uh, I've had a variety of meetings with the uh, members of the League of Cities. I've got another one I'm going to uh, this weekend where uh, uh, Sheriff Luna will be there. Looking forward to talking to him. And another organization I'm part of it has a personal meeting with the uh, new executive chair of the Coastal Commission. So I'm looking forward to that eagerly. And uh, I hope I can present a friendly face for Malibu to them. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And I'm really glad we were able to accomplish something tonight. Thank you, Paul. Well, Marianne or Doug, somebody step forward. I'll go. Um, <clears throat> I attended um, a couple ad hoc committees, road race. Um, Paul and I attended the school district uh, mediation meeting this week, last week. Um, met with assembly member Jackie Irwin to try and introduce her to our community. She is now our representative. This is a new area for her. Uh, so 
just started with introductions and hope to form um, a strong bond with that office. I think that we'll be able to do good work with her. Um, and I introduced at the library speaker series uh, last week, um, another great presentation, and I want to thank staff. Um, you know, it's a great crop collaboration between the city of Malibu and the county of Los Angeles to put those programs together and they're very informative and well attended and I just want to thank you staff for everything um, and the same uh, welcome sergeant and I uh, also wanted to thank uh, state parks they had been invited to a public safety commission meeting um, about the Point Doom state headlands and the traffic issues that are going out there and they have adjusted some of their time that they're going out there and uh, writing tickets. I did see them out there near sundown. So I just wanted to thank State Parks for also participating and helping uh, parking enforcement in that area. That's all I've got. Doug? Okay. Uh, first off, Sergeant, welcome, welcome to our community. Thank you very much for your service to the uh, county. And uh, I know you come very highly recommended uh, Captain C2 uh, said she was giving us a real uh, gem with you, so welcome aboard. Um, let's see, on the 21st, uh, I was the alternative attendee for the Council of Governments meeting. Uh, two key points I want to have as takeaways from that meeting. Uh, the county's increasing its cost for contract services by 7.63%. Uh, that's going to be across the board, but primarily I think it's going to affect our Sheriff's Department uh, contract. And the... Um, the Cooperative Liability Insurance Fund is expected to lose its coverage for uh, uh, claims above $10 million. And the reason for this is the premiums, uh, while they're rather robust, the claims have exceeded them for the last several years by two to three times that amount. So the carriers are not going to want to uh, insure us with any anymore. And that's, that's a countywide issue. Uh, met on the uh, 25th with uh, Assembly uh, Member uh, Jackie Irwin. Uh, Paul was there, Marianne, and for the city attorney, we were Brown Act compliant. I want you to know that. We've worked diligently on that. Um, she is a very good addition, I think, to our coverage for the city and uh, a welcome partner, and I, I think uh, uh, we're going to be able to work well with her. <clears throat> Had uh, several meetings this last week with local residents regarding their concerns about uh, recent and current events with MRCA. I think we have a, uh, an issue there that goes on and on, and uh, we'll have to address that at some point. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that we have a resolution uh, uh, report from the city treasurer that was emailed to the council members. Uh, I understand that going forward, it's going to be in the monthly package, probably the last meeting of each month. And this is uh, indicating quite a change in our cash management uh, process, as we've talked about before. The city has, uh, according to that report, about $80 million. It's been up to $90 million number in cash balances that we have. Uh, we're starting to invest that more robustly but safely. And the report shows we're getting about 2% interest as we wind our way into more uh, robust T-bill purchases and so forth. That number should increase to 3 to 4%. You can do the math very quickly. It goes from a year or two ago where we had virtually no income to now we're talking about three million or so uh, of additional funds in our reserve account it's very nice to see it happen <laughs> it's very nice to have that happen it puts uh, some money in our pocket to do things like buy snack snack shacks um, finally Doug Burge great comment about unintended consequences I think it's a very valid point and I hope the uh, uh, planning department uh, implements that uh, gives us recommendations on how to do it uh, it was a difficult decision, by the way, last week, but uh, I think it was the right decision, and it certainly is something that we need to make make uh, uh, make an effort to make sure that the uh, applicants don't suffer at the last minute. And with that, that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Doug. Steve? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had a relatively quiet couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of things. We've had the CAL strategy meetings uh, on our Monday morning, and like the uh, city manager mentioned, uh, they've been working diligent, diligently with us to help deal with this extension of the, uh, the waiver for fees uh, based upon the, the fire. So uh, that's, I'm glad to see that's, that's moving forward very quickly. 
Uh, we had the meeting last week uh, regarding the work plan, which didn't really pan out very well. Only three of us showed up. Uh, but we're bringing that back. I think that's, that's a very, there's some very important things on that agenda, which we gotta, we gotta take care of. Um, I also have had a number of conversations the last couple of weeks with people dealing with the MRCA, uh, folks up in Winding Way and Murphy Way. Uh, so I think that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue we're gonna have to deal with at some point in time. And I just wanna bring one other item up. I had a conversation with one of the residents who has got some suggestions of things we could do to deal with some of the problems that are facing us over the next couple of years. Uh, and he has requested a closed session uh, with the city council uh, to sort of go through those things. And I think the purpose is to make sure that, you know, if, we, if, if there's some things in there we can do, we don't broadcast that out any more than we have to. So I'd like to ask and see if there's a, a consensus from the council to sit down and have a closed session. I think, Trevor, you've, they've talked to you about this, I believe. Is that correct? I don't think so. What, if you want to set a closed session, we should discuss it. A closed time. session with a resident, having a resident sit in a closed session with the city council. It needs to fall under one of the, the categories, specific categories that would allow us to speak. It had to be about one of the there's specific topics that allow that. Say that happen. again, I didn't hear you. Sorry, there's only specific reasons that we're allowed to go into closed session. We can't just discuss with someone, so it would have to be about pending litigation about potential real estate purchase, um, you know, other types of issues. It's very limited what we can um, put so in a closed we, session. So we cannot have a session where they just present us with ideas that they have in terms of solutions to some of the problems facing us. Is that no. What you're saying? No, we want to be able to have a closed session just about general ideas. Okay, then let me go back and revisit with that person and see if, if we can find a better way to phrase that. So, okay. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I've got, Mayor. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Steve, I think the resident who wants to have that conversation would have to approach us about potential litigation or real estate purchase or something like okay. that. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank the public speakers, um, both, both written as well as oral tonight. Um, Doug Burge, um, I'm not sure I would call what happened unintended consequences. I think it actually identified an issue that needs to be addressed. And if I understand the issue correctly, it's that we, we probably need, we need an amendment, but something in writing that specifies that when you are informed that there's going to be development within a thousand feet of your home, um, there's 300 feet, I thought, okay, whatever it is, um, you have a specified amount of time to request your PVD. Um, or forever hold your peace, and that 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 sounds reasonable. There, and I don't think it was a difficult issue that there there was no deadline in the code. There is no deadline in the code, so we did what we had to do last time. And um, Richard, that's probably something to be thinking about how we can establish some kind of deadline. I don't think we can just have the staff start having one. So um, we'll have to look into that. But th but thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I think that was something that was troubling Marianne last week was the, the amount of time that it took. But the, the code is what it is right now. Um, the county tax assessor had asked me, it's, it, this is, it, it's interesting because it's the same issue as the Woolsey fire. The county, the county task, tax assessor asked me to remind the public that there's a misfortune and calamity program, um, which provides an opportunity to lower annual property tax bills for properties that have sustained a minimum of $10,000 in damage or been destroyed. Um, until the property is repaired and rebuilt. So people have been using that for the Woolsey fire, and that's what we're dealing with um, Assembly per, um, Member Irwin to get an extension for the fire. But that's also available for storm damage. If anybody has had $10,000 or more in storm damage over the past few months, the um, county program applies to that as well. And going forward, pretty much just any natural calamity that might reduce um, the value of your house in the short term. Um, as has been reported already, we are working with CalStrat and Assembly Member Irwin to secure an extension of the tax relief program uh, beyond five years for the Woolsey fire. And th the reason for that is because COVID-19 COVID essentially put a two to three year crimp on people's ability to go forward in court with SCE, um, as well as created all kinds of construction delays. So um, we're, we're more than cautiously optimistic. We're optimistic that that's going to um, receive approval. And incidentally, when the tax assessor alerted me to this, um, f this program and asked that I bring it to people's attention, I told him that we were doing that, and he said he would be supportive of the uh, proposal. Um, and um, as city manager mentioned, um, we met with Supervisor Horvath last week 
um, it was a week and a half ago now, um, it was for the general purpose of developing a cooperative relationship, but we also specifically had an opportunity to speak about Camp Kilpatrick and what's going on there, and that's an evolving situation. Um, we got half a loaf as a result of our conversation. I mean, there, there was a proposal on the table um, a week or two ago to um, increase the uh, population of more severe um, juvenile con convicts to 20 some, some odd number and then ultimately to 40. And um, as a result of our discussion, the supervisor did um, request and succeed in getting an amendment to the provision that is silent as to the number at this point and um, incorporated an obligation to consider the, um, health, well, the health, welfare, and safety of our area. Uh, and that'll be the subject of the evolving conversation. And that's it for my report. So that takes us to the consent calendar. I assume we all want to move forward or? Yes. Okay. Nobody wants break? So uh, has, the, has any member of the public removed anything from the consent calendar? We haven't received any speaker sign-ups. I'd ask any members of the public on Zoom who'd like to pull, discuss an item on the consent calendar to raise their hand. And Mayor, I'm not seeing any raised hands, so no, no items have been pulled by the public. Okay, does any member of council wish to remove anything from the consent calendar, or pull, I should say? Mary? I just have a clarifying question about the Federal Surface Transportation Program. I read I, it in... I'm so sorry, Mayor, we did just have a raised hand from the public. If you'd bear with us working out the kinks and sure. perhaps hear their comment. We'll hear from Marissa Coughlin. Well, right, on just on what number she wants to pull at this point. No comment on I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to lower my hand on the screen, and I didn't realize it had been not, uh, possibly lowered by the clerk. Thank you, Marissa. Okay, sorry. Okay, Marianne. Um, I read in the report that those funds are calculated by population. Is there any consideration given to high volumes of through traffic or visitor traffic when calculating those funds? Is, is there another category that perhaps we can get more money? Or? I, I can I can ask Metro, but this is a this is their program that they administer from uh, the federal government. It, it's all based on population, but I can ask to see if there's anything similar to that based on the number of vehicles. But I think this is a federal program that is administered by Metro. Yeah, just, you know, we're not your typical rural road that people are just occasionally driving on that with all the visitors, we would hopefully get a few more dollars out of that. So that was my only question. Thank you. Okay, it looks like, Paul, did you want to pull something? I don't want to pull anything. I'd love to make a motion to uh, approve the consent Let's calendar. confirm first that there's nothing being pulled. I second that. Okay. We have the motion so moved. And she seconded. Any discussion? Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamuri? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so I'm going to adjourn the meeting in memory of John Wall, Reverend Paul Robert Elder. The six people who were murdered today in Nashville, which are Evelyn Dykhouse, Haley Scruggs, William Kinney, all nine years old. Cynthia Peake, Catherine Kuntz, and Mike Hill. And um, former Mayor Jefferson had asked us, to, <laughs> Wagner, had asked us to uh, recognize Rick Hadzi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Hoxson. Thank you. So with that, we're adjourned.